Father, we bless you this morning in the name and the power of your Son by the person of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would disrupt our plans to have a normal, orchestrated, rehearsed service, Father. Just come and, come and arrest us with your Holy Spirit and cause us to have an experience that we haven't had in many years. Father, we give you complete permission to take over this message, take over the divine liturgy, and cause us to be disrupted, Lord, this morning. Feed us not the milk of your word and move us beyond the bread of your word, Lord. Take us to the very meat and the very heart of what we're called to hear this morning. We pray for every person who's traveling this morning, and especially for our beloved Archbishop, Lord. We pray traveling mercies over him, and we thank God for every situation, Lord, that's watching and tuning in, every situation that needs to be untied. We thank you for every cult that's watching. We thank you for everybody who's bound up this morning. Yes, Lord, we know they found the right channel. Yes. And so we bless you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. You can finally be seated. Amen. Well, this morning, I know there are some cults in the house. I know there are some tied up folk in the house. I know there are some tied up people watching on the World Wide Web. And this morning, you've locked into the right place. And I want you to stop scrolling and just, and just watch us for a minute and comment below if you have a prayer request. Let's thank God this morning that we have, we have a world watching with us, beloved, all around South Africa, Pennsylvania, all over. We thank God for all of you. Well, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture this morning, beloved, and so it's, a, it's easy to not have to spend a whole lot of time with the text because we're very familiar with this part of the gospel. Mark's gospel specifically is unique uh, in that it tells us some details that other gospels didn't tell us. For example, the gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus planned to return the cult, which is important for some of, some of us who thought maybe that he was giving us permission to steal. The Lord has need of it, and that's not going to happen. Amen. Um, we got to return whatever we take for God, uh, which is a blessing for some folks listening. You know, and I think when we talk about the palms, we have to go back to where the palms originated from. So, uh, Deacon Caleb, I'm going to see if you can pull up Leviticus 2340 for me. And we're gonna read, we're gonna, I'm going to read this out loud to us because these are strange instructions that were given back in the Feast of Tabernacles that are being carried over. And a lot of us have experienced Palm Sundays, but we really have no idea why we have palms. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why, because if you have the what and you don't have the why, you have religion. I'm going to say that one more time. If you have the what and you don't know the why, you have dead religion. I've had many conversations with people who say, why do we have icons? Well, that's a beautiful question because some people just have icons. They don't know why. Some people have chalices, but they don't know why. Some of us have altars, but we don't know why. So if we have the what, but we don't have the why, we fall into the pattern of dead religion, and we can become, casual, we can become a casualty of dead religion because a lot of people have experienced churches but not experienced God. A lot of people have experienced the blessing, but they've never met the blesser. Uh, I'm going to start us out this morning. A lot of people have experienced the prize, but they've never experienced the person who, who built the prize. You got to meet the fathers to realize why these things are happening. Why do we have robes? Why do we have stoles? Why do we have crosses? If we don't take the time, beloved, to do the work on figuring out the why, the what becomes less important. Amen. So that was for free. I'm not going to charge an offering for any of that. The, 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 the. All right, Leviticus 23, 40. Listen, beloved. And you yourselves take for yourselves on the first day the, the fruit of beautiful trees. Everybody say beautiful trees. Beautiful trees. As opposed to ugly trees. Branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the, the Lord your God for seven days. How long should we rejoice? An hour and a half on Sundays? Let me read it one more time. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees. Now listen, this is the part of the scripture that you might miss if you're watching. Because every good Jewish person didn't just have the palm. They had something else as an instrument of worship. What else did they have? On this day, they were waving the palms because it was victory. But the other thing they had was willows 
of the brook. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, willows of the brook. In one hand, they had the palm. In the other hand, they had the willow. And if you don't know what a willow is, I'm going I'm to explain it to you. A willow, also known as a weeping willow, a weeping willow, go ahead and put the tree up there, Caleb. You know, palms stick out bright. They're, they're fully ready to go. They're victory. Then you look at the weeping willow, and it looks like tears. It's a sad tree. It's a heavy tree. It's a hanging tree. It's a struggling tree. So you can't just have in one hand the victory of God. You have to also carry the sorrow of God with you as you walk along. Oh, a whole lot of Christians want the victory, but they don't want the sorrow. When you have the victory with the sorrow, you lift them up. Put the scripture back up, Deacon Caleb. These Israelites were standing there and they're saying, you didn't just call me to have the victory. You called me to have the pain. And with both, I'm going to worship you for seven days. Because no matter what's going on in your life, beloved, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and there is no God like him. So we read our scripture this morning. The text tells us they brought out Palms, but they also had with them in their house the branches from the willow tree. Who's ever seen a willow tree in here, a weeping willow? My mamma, that's what we call grandmas in the south, my mamma had a willow tree right in front of her house. And we used to make mud pies under the, under the willow tree. Nobody knows anything about that in here. But anyways, we used to play under the willow tree, and we used to realize that you know, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was an eye, it, it caught our eye. It was just like a symbolism. But whenever we broke the rules, she said, go out and pick a switch. And for those of you who don't know what a switch is, it's an instrument of punishment. So my brother would always go out and pick a little tiny, tiny, uh, tiny branch thinking it was going to be less painful, and I would just grab one off, and I knew I would, either way, we're going to go through it, brother. It's going to happen, all right? Unless she forgets, and that's not going to happen. So even though we were sitting around wondering if she would. Uh, but that's the reality is you, you look at the willow tree. And when I think of willow trees, I think of suffering. I think of pain. I think of hurting. When I think of palm trees, I think of like the beach and snorkeling. And I think of, uh, you know, of hammocks and enjoying ourselves by the palm trees. And how many of you know the Christian walk is made up of both of those worlds, the suffering world, and it's made up of the happy, victorious world? Let's thank God for that. When I, you know, I think the reality is on Palm Sunday we have two things to reflect on. Oh, let me say this. One represents health. The palm tree represents health. The willow tree represents sickness. The palm tree represents life. The willow tree represents death. One represents rest and victory, and the other represents pain and difficulty. Look at your neighbor and say, pain and difficulty. One represents abundance, the other represents lack. Do you guys know at the florist, they're using the same flowers to make wedding bouquets as they are the sprays for the caskets? They're, making, they're using the same flowers. Life is made up of sunshine and rain. We have palm days where our health is good and all is well. And then we might have willow days where our health is a challenge and we struggle just to get out of bed. There's palm days and there's willow days. We have palm days where our relationships are all on point and we're good with everybody. Or we have willow days when we feel like we're going to hell on a slip and slide. It seems like every relationship is broken and in desperate need of repair. We have palm days when there's stimulus checks going into our bank accounts. Everybody say amen. If we can't get an amen on that one, it's going to be tough. And we're walking in the store like we own the place. And we have willow days when we can't rub two pennies together to make a nickel. It's so true, beloved. I had an experience in Knoxville. This was about, this was about 19 years ago where I did a, a little experiment called the Urban Plunge. If you've never heard of an Urban Plunge, it's a beautiful experience. It's where you get to be homeless for three days. So my friends and I were all ready, ready for this whole experience to, to experience life as a homeless per person. We were excited at this experience because it was new. It was something that was going to be something we could tell stories about, and here I go. 
We didn't shave for three days, didn't take baths. We really had to look the part. And so we all, they dropped us off right in front of the, the Salvation Army there in Knoxville. And for the next 72 hours, we were going to live as homeless people in our city. It was such a, a, such a gripping experience because quickly it started to rain. And we realized there was no covering to keep us dry. So after about 10 minutes, our socks were wet, our shoes were wet, our bodies were wet. And we're like, we want this trip to be over. We had 71 hours, 30 minutes to go. Amen? And we experienced dumpster diving, and I met these two people. One was named Whiskey, the other was named Vicky. And they were incredible people, but you know what I realized was these homeless people made, took more care to make sure we had our needs met than they were worried about us giving them something. But there was a critical moment where we were in front of the Albertsons there, the grocery store, and I was holding a sign that said hungry, and we were 48 hours in, and so I was hungry at this point. And I remember that we had, we had a, you know, a mother going in, and I was holding the sign, and if you looked at me, you wouldn't know me. And she turned her child's head to look away from me holding the hungry sign as they rushed into the grocery store. She was coaching her son not to see poverty and not to see struggle. Our entire life, our society has coached us to avoid struggle and to avoid pain when half of the Christian life is meant to be served in the willow tree. On this Palm Sunday, we have to learn to worship with both the palm and the weeping willow branches in our hands. Here's the key. Whether we're in palms or in the willows, how many of you know God is the same? Everybody say, he's the same. He is faithful no matter whether we're sick or whether we're well. His goodness is available to us all the time. He's not just the God of good times. He's the, God, he's the same God during the weeping challenges and pain. And I think my heart, our heart goes out to Boulder. And we think about the great tragedy that happened just north of where we are right now. And I'm realizing that we shouldn't be surprised by brokenness and by struggling and by suffering, beloved. We live in a world that is broken and full of suffering. But we have to realize there's a palm tree just on the other side of the willow tree. God puts palm days in our life. These days for me look like sunshine, music, sunroof open, all is well. Everybody say amen. And I think a Q Bobby McFerrin song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Those are the palm days. How many of you are in a palm day right now? Raise your hand if you say, I I'm kind of doing okay. Isaiah 15, 7, you can put it up, Deacon Caleb. This is powerful. Therefore, the abundance they have gained, they laid it up. They will carry it away to the brooks of the willows. Even when we're having palm days, all that we've gathered up, beloved, we're going to carry to the, to the brook of the willows. In the next moment, in the next moment, all that we've gathered up will be taken away. And even in those moments, we have to realize God is still on the throne. It doesn't matter what the tragedy or the trauma is, our God is faithful through it all. To the brook of the willows. Just, it turns out that there are only two times when we are most vulnerable. Listen, we're most vulnerable when we have nothing, and we're most vulnerable when we have everything. Sometimes I don't worry about the people who are having willow days because they're early to church. They're usually really a good company for God because our prayer life is on fire when, when our neighbor's in the hospital in ICU with a triple bypass. How many of you know that's true? When we're, when we're walking through hell, our prayer life fires up. I mean, when, it, when, it, when all is going downhill, it's like, will you pray with me, Father? I don't get a whole lot of calls that people say, well, I'm having a palm day. I just, got a, I just won the lottery. Pray with me that I can steward my new blessing in the right way. Amen? One phone call can turn a palm day into a willow day. On the same note, one phone call can turn a willow day into a palm day. Philippians 4.12 says, I know what it is to be in need. This is the Apostle Paul. And I want us to think about this not in terms of just physical need, but think about this in terms of emotional and spiritual need. 
I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, whether we abase or whether we abound, whether we're sober or we've relapsed, whether we're in relationships going well or whether we're challenged. Either way, how many of you know that God is with us through it all? Amen? Amen? You know, a lot of us think that when God was, was creating the world, he started, with, he, we started, he started with light. But how many of you know that on the first day it says there was evening and there was morning the first day? See, God always starts with darkness. And when he said, let there be light, he had to create darkness before he could create light. How many of you know that's true? The first thing created had to be something that was void. Otherwise, lightness could not be seen. This morning, look around and realize, are you seeing light or are you seeing what light lights up? Are we seeing the light, or are we seeing what light bounces off of and allows us to see? God always starts with the darkness, and then he begins to create the light. There's always a morning after a dark night. He wants us to know that no matter how dark it may seem, no matter how desperate we may be, we're going to finish in the sunshine. Amen? That's why he gave us the commandment. The Apostle Paul also says in Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say, Let's say it together. Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say, Rejoice. That word rejoice means to spin violently. When was the last time we had one, a good old-fashioned spinning? Think about it. We were commanded to spin like tops and knowing that our God, no matter what's happening around us, is on the throne. This is the hope I carry into hospital rooms when I'm going for a pastoral visit. This is the hope we carry into dark situations when a diagnosis has been given and we don't know what the resolution is going to be. This is the hope we, we have when we sit next to Deaconess Chana and we know it doesn't look good. This is the hope we have when Bishop Cyril gets a bad diagnosis. This is the hope we have when my son's trying to do math. Amen? It ranks up there real close to where that was. I mean, real life situations where we're challenged with these things that come at us from nowhere. We receive the phone call. We receive the challenge. There's a wayward child. There's all kinds of things happening. And we have to realize that in the midst of it all, we still have a choice whether or not to grumble or whether to rejoice. Some some days I wake up with a scowl. I know none of you do this. I'm going to confess now. I wake up with a scowl, and I know it's going to be a rough day. I mean, I'm driving into work. It's tore up from the floor up. I mean, I'm just going in thinking this isn't going to happen. Can I even make it till noon? I want to just call in sick. Everything is wrong. These are, I I call these my headache days. Anybody else have headache days? I, I don't know if we do here in this house. We're all blessed and whole. But, I mean, there's maybe one or two that have a headache every now and then. And you realize what's happening. And you realize that there, there's, there's a challenge just to put one foot in front of the other. And you find yourself in the emotional pit. Well, there's a beautiful thing about the pit because you learn pit lessons. We learn more in our struggle than we do in our blessing. Amen. Our character is forged when things aren't going well, and we need somebody else just to help us get through this next minute. The pit teaches us valuable lessons, and I have I have a saying that's the pit, it's the priests in training or people in training. God will allow the pit situation to prepare us for the palace experience. Because he didn't build us for the pit. He built us for the palace. But without the lessons from the pit, we would misnegotiate the palace when we get there. Thank you for those three amens. God is on the throne. Amen. But the Bible says that we will always bring our willows to rejoice. I, I wouldn't say right now I'm in a willow place. I would say I'm in a palm place. Things are going pretty well. They're building our new home. In Broomfield, both of my sons are well in school. My relationships are in an honest place. This Lent has been so challenging but so good. Palm is calm. 
But I might be one phone call away this, for this afternoon from somebody that I love has just taken a turn for the worse. The most exciting parts of a roller coaster aren't when you're going up. Click, 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 click. The most exciting parts of the roller coaster is when you hit the top and you start tilting downward. Because that's when true life starts to happen, beloved. You see, it's not about what's happening around the altar on a Sunday or on a Wednesday. It's what's happening at the dining room table on a Tuesday night. What's happening in the bedroom on a Monday evening. What's happening on a Thursday morning. That's where the true, the true rubber meets the road of spirituality. You know, I complain and lean on my wife a lot during Willow Days. We all have lightning rods that we choose to lean on when things aren't going well. And we have to be careful how we lean when we're being pushed or challenged. Is our leaning complaining? Is our leaning gossiping? Is our leaning pressuring? Or is our leaning, what I said, it's, it's, it's allowing my, what you're saying to just hit for a moment and then it has to leave that person. You might be somebody who's leaning on someone now and you have to realize they're taking on the pressure of your struggle because they love you that much. But the people who take on the pressure of other people and they never realize how to appropriately push back and help people stand back up straight eventually start to, start to tilt and start to be crushed. There's only so much we can start to carry in terms of pain for other people. It's called vicarious trauma. You might be a caregiver who turns into someone who needs care after you hear these stories and all these experiences. And we have to realize it's just a matter of time. So I lean on my wife. I lean on mother. I lean on different people to help me to to stand even whenever I'm feeling weak. And you might be one of the people who, who, who needs to push back up. But, I, you know, it's very rare on, on my palm days that I walk, you know, I walk over and hug her and say, Honey, I love the life we're building together. You look so beautiful. All is well. You know, we're really loud because the sirens are going when there's, pet, when, there's, uh, when there's willows. But during the palm days, sometimes we're too quiet. We don't affirm those who are close to us. When my boys are doing their homework, do I walk over to them and say, you know, I noticed how on task you were. I'm so proud of you. And we have to realize that it takes four deposits of positivity to counter every one negative interaction. I said it takes four positive investments to counter one negative push. So if all I'm doing is pushing somebody and telling them what needs to be corrected and I'm I'm challenging them and I'm coming against them and I'm telling them all that I see that's wrong and I haven't made any positive investments in that relationship, before long that relationship is going to be deathly at risk. I know this may not be good for Palm Sunday, but it's good for relationships. Amen? where's Where's your relational capital with your spouse? Where's our relational capital with our children? Where's our relational capital with our employer? Where's our relational capital with our coworkers? Relational capital means I've made some investments in you. And guess what happens when you make enough investments in somebody? You're close to them, you're talking to them, you're loving on them, you're hugging on them, you're encouraging them, you're giving them birthday cards. When you do have something to say that's going to challenge them, guess what they're going to be ready to do? Listen. But if I walk up to somebody I've made all these kind of withdrawals about and my account's in the red and I'm going to start trying to correct them even more, guess what's going to happen in them? They're not going to hear one word we have to say. Let's take, man, man, let's just take out a a post-it note this week. Let's take a pen, put it in our pocket, and let's just put a tally every time we encourage and lift up our family. And then on a separate post-it note, let's put a a tally mark every time we bring correction or we we say something that's not helpful in the moment. And at the end of the week, let's do an evaluation. How much have I invested? How much have I lifted up, encouraged, and, and and I've blessed? And how much have I criticized and challenged and torn down? If we ever learn that God is just present on Palm Sundays, 
We can hear him just as clearly when, you know, when things are going well. God is just as present when things are going well. That sometimes can be when we're the most challenged. I think about the times when I've had major willow days. And this, this is, again, some confession. Three years ago, I was, I was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. I had two people who loved me very much that stood by me through the entire process because it's hard for public figures to struggle in front of public people because public people who see public figures struggle judge and they don't love and serve sometimes. You see, we want to keep our private lives private and our public lives veneer. But when we can make our private life more publicly visible, people around us will build trust. They will start to trust us more because they'll realize, well, you're not acting fake. You're bringing, you're bringing 100% truth when you come on Sundays. The day I got rear-ended on I-25, I remember that day very well. I was sitting there just kind of going forward in traffic, stop and go, and then a car hit the car behind me and pow! Transported to the hospital for, back, for a back injury. The day my dad had triple bypass surgery. These are just some willow days. The day when I, I've had re- deep relational conflict and had to speak truth even though it was very, very difficult to people that I really, really love. The days when I see people, when I, when I get calls that you're struggling Get calls that my wife's struggling. Get calls that somebody at work is struggling. See, these are all willow days where we live every single daily life. When, when we realize that a tragedy happened with a pet, these, these are all part of life. But I could also write on here 25 times when I've had palm days and I've had amazing experiences and God's lifted me through every one of them. Amen? You see, we have to do a better job, beloved, of carrying both the palm and the willow. And being honest about our our willows. Because sometimes, and I I tell people this, this week I was having a conversation. I said there's three dimensions to truth. There's the secret dimension. The secret dimension usually only we know ourselves. There's the private dimension, which the people closest to us know. And then there's the public domain. And leadership uh, circles teach this idea of the Jahari window. The Jahari window means that I'm trying to expand my secret window by including one other person in that situation because it's only when I have unity linked to someone else that I have strength and leverage in the Spirit of God. If I'm struggling alone and I have no one that I've reached out to about a situation, then I, then I am at risk and vulnerable. But when I reach out to even one other person, I now have the ability to agree with them in a situation. Amen? So we expand the secret window into the private window. We expand the private window into more of the public window. And then we agree that no matter what's shared in this house or what's shared over the web, that you guys, that we're going to encourage one another, lift one another up, and we're going to pray instead of gossip and challenge and complain. The vision of the cathedral is that we are a spiritual hospital, not a courtroom. Let me say that one more time because I think that was decent. You know, as a cathedral, we're called to be a spiritual hospital. We're not called to be a spiritual courtroom. And when I go to a hospital, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to triage me. What is triage? Can I get your name, your date of birth, your first of kin? Do you want to do not resuscitate? Or that's not that's not triage. Triage is get in here. We got to take care of you and get you back to normal, so we can have a conversation about what your name is, your date of birth, and all those things. When we went, when Katie, when Katie's water broke and we're in there to give birth, they they didn't ask us a whole bunch of questions. They just said, get in the room where the business is going to take place, and then we'll deal with the business part of this later. We can't want to do business with people who are just walking in and and discovering God for the first time. It's a matter for us to love on them, hug on them, and show them the warmth of Christ. Whether you ever come back or whether you don't, we're going to love on you. We're going to make it difficult to leave. No, we're going to, Jesus is the defense attorney. 
you know, and then there's going to be the devil being the prosecuting attorney. And then we're going to give them the heavy, the heavy story about it. Well, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? That's not the way we're called to be wired, beloved. When the Lord was riding in on a donkey, he was saying, I'm bringing with me the hospital to heal every person around the world. Now, after they triage you in the hospital, they're going to take registration. But they're not taking registration before they take your temperature. They're not taking registration before they take your blood pressure. They're not taking registration before they take care of you. As the house of God, we're called to take care of every single person around us, on the job, in our homes, in the supermarket, no matter where we are. We're called to be caretakers first, and then we deal with the business after that. Amen? After you get the evaluation, or after you get the triage, you get the registration, and they give you one of the armbands. And after you get your armband, guess what they do? They do an evaluation. Most people in church don't like the evaluation process. That's where we lose a lot of people. Because that's where we say, tell me about your eating habits. Tell me about how you're sleeping. And they start to look for the, cause, the root cause of the pain that you complained about when you came into the house of God. That's the evaluation process. And once you're evaluated, guess what they do? Guess what, Grable? Treatment. Oh, I, I'm not, this is a heavy duty place because when they start, they assign a prescription, and there's some people who say, Well, I'm not taking that. <laughs> this is an amen free zone, Bob. You don't have to amen at all. <laughs> when they assign a prescription, they say, Well, I just don't have to do that. I don't think I need that pill. I don't think I need that treatment. What's this doctor thinking? I'm not, I'm not a person who takes pills. Guess what? The person, the patient, knows more than the doctor. God help us. Because this person who's coming in to treat us has devoted 16 years of his or her life to be an expert in knowing what pill you need. And then, you know, people, and if you take this to the spiritual level, you have people coming in and saying, my life's falling apart, my marriage is falling apart, my kids are going wayward. And then we ask, and then when we start evaluating, We've triaged, we've registered, we start evaluating, we say, well, when's the last time you revisited your baptismal vows? Are you eating your spiritual broccoli? Have you been to Eucharist for two years straight without missing one Sunday? Have you confessed to someone recently? Have you put your marriage in front of, in front of God, in front of the priest? Have you allowed yourself to eat the broccolis and the meat of the Word? We should have a rule, no special counseling until you've been to liturgy at least 10 times in a row and heard the messages that one of the greatest preachers in the world, our bishop, has preached 10 times in a row. Because I guarantee you, when you commit yourself to staying faithful every single time, God's going to lift all boats in your household. Amen? And after you get the treatment, you get a reevaluation, then they put you in the wheelchair. I know none of you have experienced this, maybe a couple of you, but they put you in the wheelchair because they won't let you walk out because if you trip and fall, it's going to be on them. So they say, sit down, you're going to be walking. There's a lot of people saying, I can walk myself out of the hospital. No, you're not. You're going to get rolled out. And it takes about seven hours to finally get released. Oh, there's a whole message in just waiting. We want God to act right now with the easy button. And sometimes God says, well, you're about two years out from your blessing. Don't leave your relationships. <laughs> so here you are being, you know, wheeled out. And then you get in the car, a vehicle of someone who you love, and they drive you home. And then you are, you're all praying. You can hopefully do what they just did in the hospital. That's the spiritual hospital we're called to be as a cathedral, beloved. That's the process we walk with people through as they discover the holy faith. And if we abandon them at any point in that process, they're not going to be long-term members and healthy members coming back willing to volunteer in the spiritual hospital to help somebody else get out of the mess that they find themselves in. Amen? Our, call, our calling is to worship God no matter, state, no matter what state we're found in. 
This morning we're called to hold the willow and the palm. Stand with me, beloved. And that's the vision of this cathedral. I wanted to, share, I wanted to make sure that was part of the message this morning. We're called to be a spiritual hospital, not a spiritual courtroom. We're not going ha- to ask you what would happen if you were to die tonight. Because the reality is some of us have already found ourselves in the midst of heaven. And some of us have already found ourselves in the midst of hell. It's about bringing heaven to earth through his body. Amen? Father, we lift up your people now. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for their faithfulness, for their commitment. We thank you for this cathedral house that is a spiritual hospital. Lord, and we bless you right now for everyone who's tied up when they tuned in. We thank you, Lord, that you are in the business of untying and setting free. Lord, whether we're in a palm season or whether we're in a willow season, we give you all thanks, honor, and praise. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. High five your neighbor and say, willows or palms, we're in it together. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God. We believe in one God.